This podcast is brought to you thanks to the generous support of Whistler Blackcomb, leaders in delivering adventure. And we we laid out and designed and built the world's first ever snowmobile assisted ski hill. Now it operates almost similar to how you would shuttle downhill mountain biking. Um, you know, it is a ways in. It's that's probably the only downfall is that it's about 10 kilometers in off the highway. So you got to snowmobile in. We snowmobile in with you know, four of our buddies and four sleds, and we double up to the top. And two guys will get off and ski down, snowboard down, and the other two drive back down, and we do it again. Welcome to Delivering Adventure. This is the podcast that explores what it really takes to share adventure like a pro with your friends, your family, and as a profession. My name is Chris Capio, and I'm coming to you from Whistler, British Columbia. And I'm Jordy Shepard, recording from Canmore, Alberta. After a lifetime of working extensively in different parts of the adventure guiding industry, Chris and I have teamed up to launch this podcast. In each episode, you will hear top adventure guides, managers, marketers, and athletes share their best stories, advice, and trade secrets. The goal of this podcast is to share how you can take yourself and others farther from the mountains to the office and beyond. In this episode, Curtis Paglia continues our discussion about some of the work he has been involved in in developing recreation infrastructure and adventure experiences in the Vellmount area of British Columbia and beyond. Specifically, we want to talk to him about his involvement in helping to create Crystal Ridge, which is North America's first snowmobile-assisted ski area really quite an accomplishment. We've also wanted to get his perspective on developing a brand new guiding association for snowmobile guides, which is something that he is also involved with developing. Curtis is the executive director of the Vale Mount and Area Recreation Development Association, known as VARDA, a not-for-profit association specializing in public recreation, area development, and management. Curtis is also a Canadian Avalanche Association professional member snowmobile guide, avalanche instructor, and the owner-operator of Frozen Pirate Snow Services, which is a backcountry snowmobile guiding and avalanche safety operation. Awesome, Jordy. Let's bring Curtis back into the DA studio. All right, so here we are again with Curtis. How are you? Vail Mount still? You're still down in your basement there, I can see. <laughs> yeah, man, still in the gear room, snowboard dungeon, whatever you want to call it. It's my happy place. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Thanks for bringing me back. So in our last episode, we, we were talking about uh, mountain biking a lot. Now we're switching gears to talk about snowmobiling. Um, before we get into some of the achievements that you've done uh, out there in Vail Mount, can you tell us a little bit about what snowmobiling is like? You know, So for the people that are out there that have maybe never had an opportunity to do that before, what is it like? Why do people like to do it? Like a lot of people may have just actually just seen it on, on, on television commercials on, or on TV. So what does it feel like? Oh man, it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it's coming from, um, you know, I'm a lifelong snowboarder, snow guy. Um, you know, I've, I've heli skied, cat skied. Um, I would still rather grab my snowmobile and my snowboard and hit the back country than, than any of those other options there. Um, things have changed it's you know snowmobiles have changed um it's not this this old loud smoky thing that you know where every motorized activity or every piece of motorized equipment change or happened back in the day um you know they've gone they've gone more efficient they've gone quieter um it's it's flying in the backcountry you know like i've i grew up snowboarding at my local ski hills and i always thought man if i could hit that jump going the other way how rad would that be um you know if i could just if i could climb up there what what, what's over the top of that mountain and um all of that stuff is possible on on today's iron it uh it's definitely changed in the last 10 years our industry the the, the tools that we use are they're absolutely incredible um but without a helicopter or a snowmobile you know you you can't really get to some of these places that we go um i tour as well i split board i don't my i love sweating i love my bike you know i i, I climb a lot of mountains and play in the backcountry and all kinds of things um, but you can only go so far. Um, you know, we don't have that access that we can park right on the side of the road, like a Rogers pass and get in the back country. If you're in Vail Mount and you want to get into the back country, you need a helicopter or you need a snowmobile. Um, and you know, once you're, there's certainly a steep learning curve. Um, but my snowmobile is how you treat a set of skis. It's how I treat my snowboard. I am, I'm surfing on snow. I can just do it any direction I want. 
Now, can you tell us a little bit about the community, the snowmobiling community? If you, you know, what I what I know, I guess my my sense is from the outside is that it's it's pretty friendly and people get out there, share information like other communities. But if you're from maybe outside that, you just see a bunch of people with giant trucks and and sleds and you know, and and, and there you, you know, go. It, so so what's what's being a part of that community like, Curtis? <laughs> it's it's type a's for sure um uh, you know it's uh it's a uh, these machines are they're heavy they're they're fast they're powerful and and you know that that kind of expresses or explains that the user as well at times um you know you know powerful aggressive you know excited um that's what we that's what we want to do but some of the kindest people in the world um you know that'll that'll help you in, in a moment's notice and and really it's it's simply for the love of being outside like when we as a as a you know a person who brings people into the backcountry, it's sitting on top of a of a mountain safely and and looking around with someone who's never seen this before and just realizing that we couldn't have got there without a snowmobile or a helicopter. It's a it's a pretty amazing feeling. Um, the user group has changed for sure. Um, we had snowmobiling's not it's not that old. Mountain sledding is a very very young sport. It's a very young activity. You know, it's arguably the the true first mountain sled was, you know, in 96, 97. So it's, you know, it's not that old of an activity and, and getting to the mountains used to take days and, you know, now we're up there, we're up there quite quickly. So there was, um, there was certainly an, an older group for sure that is giving away and opening the doors for a, for a younger generation on some, on some, you know, certainly some more capable machines. Um, but even that generation now we're starting to see it's all backcountry enthusiasts, like all people who hunt and fish and, and camp all summer long. They just want to be out into the backcountry. And, you know, we're one of the fastest growing segments, I think, of the snowmobile industry right now is snowmobile assisted skiing and snowboarding. Like it's, I know it's very rare that I'm in the backcountry on a day off now without my snowboard strapped to my sled. Um, and I use that for access as well as just straight up sled laps, man. Like, you know, that's, it's my own personal helicopter. It's pretty exciting. So can you tell us a little bit about your guiding company and how you got that going? Sure. Yeah. Frozen Pirate Snow Services. You know, we're a, we're a fully tenured company. Um, I think we're in our eighth year of operation right now. Um, so we're a very small company. We have, you know, two or three guides, uh, myself and my main guide, Marshall Dempster, um, and, and, you know, best friend. He's actually doing the, um, the Skidoo Avalanche Tour right now all across Canada. So um, at the Bombardier dealerships, they, they give free Avalanche seminars to all of their clients for you know, kind of the months of October, November, and December. So pretty exciting. Um, Frozen Pirates, a small company based out of, out of Valemount, BC. Um, you know, we look at our, we hold ourselves to really high standard. Um, uh, we take a lot of pride in what we do. Um, and we provide adventure to, a, to people who are experienced, um, non-experienced. We run um, riding clinics and then just straight up guiding. But we, we tend to do a lot of um, avalanche safety course instruction as well. So guiding, guiding is just one facet of our business where we tend to focus a lot on the avalanche safety training. But um, you know, guiding's just guiding's just fun, bringing people into the backcountry, um, you know, experiencing what we love so much and sharing that and sharing the you know, sharing the sights and the scenes back there and it's uh it's incredible so yeah we're uh we're excited we're going into our ninth season of operation we're already booked until march so you know it feels good to be feels good to be busy and um, doing something you love for your livelihood yeah. now so for those of the listeners out there that may not have caught our first episode with you and and how you um sort of described your journey with the with the bike park there in Valmount. Can you give us a bit of a recap of what Varda is and and sort of how you got connected with that group? And then we're going to follow up with some questions on on uh, the, the, your your latest giant super cool project. Um, but I'm going to keep you in suspense. I feel like I'm on the CBC. <laughs> yep. We're going to keep you in suspense there till after after this segment. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So yeah, a bit of, bit of backstory. Um, so I do wear two hats, you know, I, I own and operate that frozen pirate snow services, which is a guiding and safety training company. And, um, and then we, my, my full-time day job is the Vale Mountain Area Recreation Development Association. Um, we're going to call that VARDA. It's much easier to say. Um, VARDA is, we began as a snowmobile club in the late nineties, Timberline snowgoers. Um, but then as mountain snowmobiling grew, um, you know, heli skiing got more busier, cat ski operations, more people entering the backcountry, whether they be guided, non-guided, members of public, 
um, we started to see some conflict in the backcountry amongst user groups and amongst users. And um, the government actually stepped in and created a sustainable resource management plan. Um, it basically went from the northern boundary of Elmont all the way up to the southern boundary of Blue River. Um, now that, in a sense, kind of broke up the backcountry a little bit. It gave everybody their sandbox and gave everybody their playground. And then Varda was created to not manage, but to, to be a to be a sounding board, be a table, um, you know, to break bread with each other and talk um, instead of instead of fight and argue. You know, my my board of directors is made up of heli ski operations, um, non motorized user groups, um, members of the public, snowmobile members, uh, members of our regional districts and local government. And, you know, we that's my board of directors. We meet once a month and we plan and talk and fix and and just just talk about issues or create new ones or you know all, all kinds of things so vart is a a really unique model of of how backcountry users can work together without necessarily without conflict and without involving government we we're we're that step before government would need to get involved and and it's worked really really well for us you know what you say there that's no small thing in all of these different right. different communities and, and sharing the land if the different groups don't work together, uh, then you're not going to find that 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 kind of that happy zone. I, I, just to share, a, just an aside, you know, I live in Whistler and I uh, do a lot of uh, canoe guiding and there's a local river here where um, there's a, a group, and I would say it's a small group, but there is a group of, of locals that don't like the commercial guides there and they will actually want to get rid of all the commercial uh, guiding uh, as opposed to coming in and saying, hey, like, how can we share this resource? You know, there's more and more people coming here. How can we work together to respect everybody's needs? And so, you know, unfortunately, that just leads to a, a lot of conflict and, and then people don't get along. So that, you know, what you're saying there about bringing everybody to the table, that is that is no small thing. And that's allowed you to help to create Crystal Ridge, which is North America's first snowmobile assisted ski area. Curtis, can you tell us about that? Well, you mentioned, yeah, you hit a couple things there, like, you know, bringing people to the table and talking and giving everybody a chance to express what they'd like to see in their community and work together. And, you know, that's kind of what, that's what Varda was and that's how it was created. It's certain, don't get me wrong. It's certainly not perfect. There's, there's challenges to everything and um, not everything is, not everything's perfect. But one of the things like when you get, a, when you get a community groups together and everybody gets a chance to talk, um, they share ideas and some of these ideas are absolutely amazing. Um, and we had a local group, they called themselves the power borders um, when when the community stake negotiations were being held to create this management plan back in 2004. And they had an idea of a public facility. So basically free for the public. That's a snowmobile assisted ski hill. So they wanted to go snowboarding in the backcountry in their own little zone. Um, you know, not a not in a not in a heli ski tenure, not in a snowmobile zone. Um, you know, we all can play together in the sandbox, sure, but they wanted their own little spot and well, they wanted their own spot. It wasn't little and but that sat idle for a while, um, but it was put in the management plan. So again, planning made it easy for Varda and myself to move a project like this forward when we felt we had the capacity. Um, so they had we kind of had this zone picked out. Um, and then again, we went through the referral process, you know, stakeholder engagement um, and we. <laughs> We laid out and designed and built the world's first ever snowmobile assisted ski hill. Now it operates almost similar to how you would shuttle downhill mountain biking. Um, you know, it is a ways in. It's that's probably the only downfall is that it's about 10 kilometers in off the highway. So you got a snowmobile in. We snowmobile in with you know four of our buddies and four sleds, and we double up to the top, and two guys will get off and ski down, snowboard down, and the other two drive back down, and we do it again. Um, and what's really special about this zone is you do feel like you're in the middle of nowhere there, you know, it's there, the runs are 2000 vertical feet and, you know, almost, almost 2000 meters long and some of the most beautiful powder snowboarding and skiing you've ever had on, you know, shallow, safe terrain. And it's, uh, it's a one of a kind facility in the world. And it's, uh, it's, it's been pretty amazing to be a part of. Curtis, how does this new sled ski hill benefit the community of Vailmont and the surrounding area? You know, Crystal Ridge, it's shown what can be done in a community. I'm not going to say it's similar to, you know, the Vailmount Bike Park or the trail systems where it's bringing in thousands of people. And it's not necessarily what the area was created for, but it 
it shows that you can, you know, you can build variety in a recreation based community. It doesn't have to be focused on one thing. It shows that you can listen to other members of the community and other user groups and, and address their needs as well. Um, but it's, it's given us something really cool to talk about um, and to be proud of. And, you know, when you can say you've built something as unique as Crystal Ridge um, and, you know, on, we haven't even seen its true potential yet. It's, I think it provides opportunity and encourages other communities to, to do similar things and to, to push what we can do with sustainable recreation. And where did the funding come from? Were there any partnerships uh, and, and any challenges with that? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, again, we're lucky being being in the in the, in the middle or at the, the northern tip of some regions and the southern tip of other regions where we have access to a few different pots um, as long as they're available and fit and fit what we're trying to do. So we got we got really lucky. And this one was actually it's called a community initiatives fund um, through through the Columbia Basin Trust. But it was it felt good because this grant and this funding source to, to really build this area um, was chosen by our community. So it was a community voted fund. Um, so, you know, it was full support from our from the members that actually live here. And that made it feel really good. And, you know, this wasn't an easy feat. This is 10 kilometers into the backcountry. Um, we had to bridge the Canoe River. It's over 100 feet. So we had to build over a 100 foot recreational bridge. Um, so that involved water permits, land permits, tons of engineers. You know, it was uh, it was a pretty amazing, amazing project. But um, this one was funded through a community initiatives project fund that was based from the Columbia Basin Trust. So it felt really good to have the support from the local community as you're moving into this type of project. Very cool. Yeah, it's uh, neat to hear about yeah coming together on that and making it making it all happen and the community being fully behind it. Did you have any economic studies or, you know, any, any, uh, templates, any, anything that you could draw from to make this happen? Like I know up by, uh, Smithers, yeah. um, there's a backcountry ski tour or a, uh, ski touring area that was kind of used, I think, co coexisting with logging and, and creating runs and glading and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Anything else like that? So, yeah. I think you're referring to Hank and Evelyn. I think that's. That's, that's the name of that place. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're, no, we didn't even know that. Well, I, I don't know if they coexisted at the same time or if they were created at the same time. Honestly, we we were working within our sustainable resource management plan and we were trying to meet the needs of members of our community and, and promises that were made. And so honestly, we we won this one. Like we just we just swung for the fences and, and, and built something cool and got our got community buy-in and you know it's um it's the pride and joy of a lot of locals it, it brings a lot of people in from the jasper area um and it's when people hear about it they want to get to it um it does have an access barrier where you are required to have a snowmobile right so um you know that's the only barrier to entry on on that area but if you want to ski in Vail Mount, you do have to have a sled and, and this is just one other option so it's been it's been highly supported and, and i would say very successful and how about some uh any list of challenges that you came across there like that i'm sure there were a number of them but any any highlighted yeah i think challenges would be maintenance um maintenance on the access road or access route so you know 10 kilometers in it requires a lot of brushing um you know uh, grooming for sure you don't want to bump your access you don't want to bump your up track the up track gets used so much because it's in a sense a, a shuttle road right um our up track's a bit steep so uh, you have to deal with the ter terrain and the topography so um, funding the, the maintenance of the area has probably been one of the biggest challenges. Um, with We had a master plan to go within the, the whole Westridge area would eventually, where this place exists, would eventually become a, a trail snowmobile destination as well as accessing Crystal Ridge. And so we'd have a little collection hut there. And, but due to um, a highly active community forest and just the industrial activity over the last 10 years in the area, that project isn't brought to light yet. There's just too much plowing of roads and non-connectivity. And so um, that's been the, been the challenge so far would be maintenance of the area. Um, but you know, it's, it's, we have a plan. We're also, it's also supplemented. It's a, it's a labor of love. So it's supplemented from some of our snowmobile areas. Um, and then 
you know, it's a public zone. Um, so user safety for sure. So trying again, trying to build for the greater community and not for yourself. Yeah. We'd all love it to be super steep and super fall line and just send it, but you know, that's not the, we didn't want to me having in my name on this facility. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do was be to create a bunch of avalanche paths and just say, have at her. Right. So. And how is this area different than if you just take your snowmobile and go out onto public land and go skiing and snowboarding, uh, off of your, sled how does it di- how does it differ i think it it provides it's an easier barrier to entry um where it's a it takes some of the guesswork out of it um you know it is shallower terrain we can say it's safer for sure like i feel comfortable saying it's much safer than going up into one of our main sled zones and you know picking a 50 degree slope and just jumping off and giving her um there's you know with designated drop off points and designated pickup points i think it makes it safer for families um, you certainly don't have as many snowmobiles flying around and, um, and it's, it's easier to find that fresh line. Yeah. There's only six runs, but they're big. Um, the areas, you know, wasn't that heavily used. Hopefully a million people listen to this podcast and come check out Crystal Ridge. Um, but I just think it's, it's a, a safe way to get into sled skiing. Yeah. And is there signage there, uh, prompts for having avalanche equipment, transceiver, shovel probe, et cetera? At our at the beginning of our uh, beginning of our trailhead, yeah, we have the we don't have a transceiver checker there just because we don't have like a you know a BCA beacon station there as we uh, it's not a manned trailhead. But you know Varda doesn't Varda was one of the I think we were the first club in the province to install those you know transceiver checkers. We were one of the first ones to forecast for our grooming operations. Um, you know the leading edge leading edge always bleeds, and we're okay with that. We try to be ahead of the industry and ahead of the curve and try to do things as safe yet as productive as possible and you know we don't mind doing things first and even if we do them wrong the first time and learn but But it is still a backcountry area so it's not controlled for avalanches it's not patrolled uh there's no one going out there to see if you're okay that's correct it's it's uh similar to a a mountain bike trail system just a a public trail system it is uh it is absolutely a a use at your own risk yeah right so everything's recommended to carry your own equipment, be self-sufficient, capable of, of, uh, self companion rescue and, uh, yeah. Communication devices, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And how successful has it been? Do you have a count? Do you know where you're at? It's the only thing we haven't been able to do. Um, you know, I'm not going to say it's been a, it's been a moneymaker. Um, it's, it's broad. Uh, I think we've hit this a little bit already where it's brought a lot of recognition to the community with something new, some, some variety, um, it's been very successful in my eyes when I go out there and I see five trucks that's five and their families and they're out there with their moms and dads and kids and, you know, they're out there riding some beautiful powder lines. And, you know, to me, to me, that's successful. Not everything has to be a, a massive economic tourism development. Some of these things can be, you know, simply for, for the community or for a smaller amount of users, but it's the being able to provide a, a variety of experiences and you know way different different ways that people can get outside and enjoy adventure. Yeah. And is it currently, or is it do you do you see it becoming a instructional kind of zone where people can you know do their first snowmobiling? They can they can do their first uh, backcountry skiing, maybe uh, avalanche safety, uh, avalanche skills training courses, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Not so much snowmobiling. We're really, um, we really discourage, you know, well, there's no off trail use of snowmobiles there. It's not a snowmobile zone. We try to make that very clear. There's really just a road in and an up track and a down track. And that's where the snowmobiles stay. Um, you, by all means, people can go and use it as a trail system and go up and have a look at the top and, you know, you get a beautiful view. And, but as far as, as far as learning to backcountry ski, learning to powder ski in a, in a bit of a safer environment, as long as of course, you've got a few buddies with you, um, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing area because it is, it is quite safe. It's shallow angle, um, you know, beautiful snow, amazing powder skiing. Um, and then ends up, you know, if you, if you go down the run, you, you can end up at a safe place for a pickup. So, um, great place to learn. Um, it's not just, you don't have to sled ski it. A lot of people do go in there in the early season, especially and tour it. Um, and you know, even myself, when I've run out of some or early season, when I haven't had any snow, I've gone up there and I've, uh, I've, I've done some AST courses up there. So, yeah. And I was thinking more for the sledding side of things, somebody, maybe they're a skier or a snowboarder, uh, or getting into that, but they're not really a, a snowmobiler. And so they could kind of cut their teeth there. Right. And sort of like, you know, on a, 
on a trail that's that's pretty set while they're getting some skiing or snowboarding in. Yeah, I, I sorry I had a laugh. I have to because it is it is a steeper up track with a couple turns in it, and we okay. do have exact we do have exactly what you're talking about. Um, where people are, you know, expert skiers and, and certainly not expert sledders and they're trying to mix the two and it can be pretty entertaining on the up track. Yeah. Okay. So definitely some sled skills required. Well, when you try to put two or three people on a sled, yeah, I've seen up to four, I've seen dogs, you've, you've seen everything up there. It's great. <laughs> Chickens, pigs, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Coming bring, along. Bring, the whole, bring the whole family for a ride. Yeah. So you've got this adventure creation skill set uh, that we've talked about in our first episode with you and now our second episode. Are there any skills that you've had to work harder on over time? And what's your advice to people that might want to develop those skills in themselves? Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot over the last 17 years and, and you know, certainly haven't been perfect um, and, and still far from it. Uh, it's going to sound cliche, but patience. Um, patience is the, is so hard when you're, when you're so passionate about your job or your, the trail you want to build or the idea you have, um, patience has certainly been the hardest learning curve for me, um, coming in. I started relatively young and excited and I had, you know, I, I had success and it seemed, everything seemed easy and then things slow down a little bit or, you know, you get new, you get new rec officers or new land managers or new councils and, um, things can change and, you know, stakeholder engagement can change in our, our environment, our community, our culture, our climate, a lot of things change. And that I had to come, I had to become more patient with that. I had to, you know, I had to work with those changes um, to all the things I mentioned before, like climate and stakeholder demand and, and environment. And um, it won't always work. Your idea won't always work. Um, you might be also working on behalf of somebody else and and that idea won't always work and you won't, you won't always understand why. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's try not to get too discouraged, try to do all you can to, to push things through the right way, make sure you do it the right way. Um, expect double the time that you would think it's going to take. And I'm still learning that to this day. Um, you know, take the timeline that you think you could do the project in and then double it. And then you're probably safe. Um, and then protect your mental health along the way. Um, I think that's extremely important. We get wrapped up in a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of projects. Um, we get involved in a lot of aspects with these things. Um, when you're looking at building a passion, um, the industry that we work in is risky. There is inherent risk. And, um, I think just keeping yourself physically healthy, but also mentally healthy is extremely important. And Others that are listening to this might want to create their own winter adventure opportunities in their region. Do you have any tips for them? Yeah, like, you know, you know, I'm not perfect. I've, you know, I've made mistakes and um, involving, involving public and, and your community in your decisions, I, I think is extremely important. Um, there's, I mentioned before, there's a, there's a IAP2, it's called a, it's a spectrum of uh, public participation. And it's a, it's a really cool kind of philosophy of, you know, informing and consulting and involving and collaborating and empowering. And all of those stages are, are stages of, of development and community development and project development. And um, I, you know, I'd really, really recommend everybody to start small and, and start, start quiet. Don't come in swinging elbows, um, come in and, you know, meet other people's concerns with respect and, and you know, ingenuity. Um, but also build partnerships and relationships first, um, you know, make sure, make, make friends first and, and then try to build on those relationships. And, and then also really think of the long game, um, think of why you want to do what you're doing, who it's going to benefit. And, um, I have to say the planning, the planning part of it is goes a long way in all of that. Cause you tend to go through all of these steps and, um, it's a, it's the biggest benefit and it's the easiest route just to have a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said 17 years in this and you know, you've got some great projects under your belt, but it's, it's 17 years, right? Like we're approaching two decades. It, it. It does, it has not happened overnight there. No, and in no, kind of what is a, a bit of a sleepy town, right? Uh, Valmont has historically been that, which, which is a great draw to go there because it actually is quieter, but yeah. it's getting busier and uh, like everywhere is. And it's because there, there's more things to offer. And part of that is because of you. So good work. Thank you.
appreciate it. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's exciting to be involved with. It's a labor of love for sure. Yeah. So what is the Canadian Backcountry Motorized Guides Association, the CMBGA, and how are you involved with that? Yeah, yeah, this one's going to come up. Hey, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really exciting new product. I, as if none of us were busy enough. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a really exciting project. Um, so I've been been an avalanche professional for for many many years now. Um, you know, member of the a professional member of the CAA for for quite some time. Um, I actually was one of the I was the second group ever to go through a CAA level two snowmobile specific program. So you know, dating myself a little bit back then. Um, and I think I've touched on it before where, um, snowmobile, snowmobiling in the snowmobile industry, you know, the mountain side of things, it hasn't been around for a very long time. And even with that, it's, it's not a, it's not a massive industry. There's not a million guides out there taking people all out over the backcountry. Um, but there, but there are some for sure. Um, and it started, it started over, I'm a huge advocate over pizza and beer, sushi and beer. Uh, hot dogs and beer. I don't know. It always comes to beer, but eat whatever you want. But basically in involvement in conversation, like table conversations. Right. Um, and I, we, that's how we hold our board meetings at Varda. It's, you know, we break bread with each other. We have a bottle of wine. Like it's, it's, I think that's where a lot of these great ideas start. And the CMBGA started in Penticton at the, you know, CAA spring meetings. Um, we're, you know, a group of, I was, I've been going to those CAA meetings, um, since, you know, since before any sledder really showed up there, Lori Zakrak, I think was probably one of the only other sledders there and Johan Slam. And, um, but you know, we were, no one talked to us. We were the little flies on the wall, hiding in the corner, intimidated by everybody. And it was just cause people didn't know who we were. We weren't really that involved in the industry because our side of the industry was so small. I truly believe we were still doing things the right way. We, you know, the right people were doing things the right way. We're working under tenures with insurances and trainings and certifications. And, but there was never, there wasn't anything similar to the ACMG or the CSGA. We know there's an industry standard out there. Um, and while our sport is, our activity is a little bit different, um, it's, it's quite similar in more ways than it's different. And the industry standard was out there and it was, it was set. Um, but our, our method of transportation or method of enjoying the backcountry is quite different. And so, you know, sitting around with professionals, um, you know, like Steve Scott and Chris Granter and, um, you know, Jason Ribby, and we had some, there's some, oh, Ian Stewart Patterson. We had some, we had some really good people out there that were talking about this and it just decided to do it. Um, you know, we now, it, it took a while um we have our president steve scott out of revelstoke he spearheaded a lot of this we have a great board of directors made of some amazing men and women from you know the educational side the acmg side just with ian i guess there as a representative and the guiding sector and we really tried to set the board up with people from a well-rounded skill set but also people who are doing things the, the right way um and, and when i say the right way i just mean you know a tenured operator with a good program and um, a respectful program um, but we knew there was a need to try to develop sta a base skill set of standards for motorized backcountry guides. Excuse me, um, motorized backcountry guides. You know, setting setting your your standards of training for avalanche, for moving through terrain, for you know, for rope rescue, for first aid. You know, all of this stuff I believe was being done. Well, is was being done by the the right people. It just wasn't put into a package, and it wasn't there was a. There was a gray area out there that we were floating in, and I think people were were discussing that behind the scenes, and we're noticing that behind the scenes, and we felt the need to begin working with um, some with our group, the Canadian Motorized Backcountry Guides Association, and try to piece this stuff together. It's a it's a work in progress for sure. Yeah, Chris and I, with the interviews we've done on this podcast with Delivering Adventure, we've talked to folks from a bunch of different industries. And really, the commonality is that the client, the public that are hiring us as guides, instructors, teachers uh, in the outdoor world, they have an expectation, right, for that there's going to be a set of best practices and, and some standards there and some skill set and, and requirements because it doesn't always go well. And, and it will often go much better if you have certified people that, that have, are meeting that best practice and standard and so, you know, not to say that the folks that have been in the motorized backcountry guiding industry haven't been doing that. They've actually probably been overcompensating a lot of them because there hasn't been that standard in place. 
um, from what I've seen. I agree. And it's been a really weird place for a person like me to, to be in. Um, you know, we didn't have somewhere to go to gain further education or further mentorship or to really put our package together or not even further education, but more to ratify what we had. Like I found myself looking at CSGA, you know, I wasn't going to be ACMG. I'm not in, I'm not into rock and, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not a mechanized ski guide. And so I found myself just kind of looking into CSGA and seeing, Hey, do I fit into there? Um, but then, you know, then I look at that and I'm like, well, I got to be a ski instructor. Okay. Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a, very good snowboarder, but I'm never going to be a ski instructor. So, you know, I didn't fit in that bubble either. So, and why was I trying to fit myself into some other bubble? Um, Just to be clear, just like ACMG, CSGA, there's no law saying you have to be one of these. It's just, it's a really, it's a really, it's the right thing to do. So some of the questions we've got, some of the feedback we have are, who are we to do this? We're just a group of people who believe in, in some sort of standard and believe in safety and believe in legitimizing the aspect of the snowmobile guiding world or the motorized guiding world. Um, none of this is mandatory. No one's going to be blackballed and shamed. And we're just, we're trying to do the, do things the right way with mentorship from ACMG, from CSGA and from our past experiences. And nobody's going to be forced to become a part of this, but we, our goal is to just be that good and that open that people want to be a part of it. Yeah, it's nice to create that pathway for people to become professional in their careers and then also for the public, the the clients who make up the industry, because without clients, there isn't a guiding industry in any part of any industry. And so they there's trust formed there, right? And brand recognition and the understanding that, oh, if I if I this is a motorized backcountry guide, that's great. Like if I, if I'm having a conversation or meeting a new person and I find out they're ACMG, CSGA, um, you know, I immediately, I know what that means. And it means that, you know, it means that I'm talking, I'm talking to someone who is a professional in their field, respected, trained. And I, I know, I, I know what that means. It has a certain amount of recognition to it uh, and deserves a certain amount of respect. And, you know, I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, man, it's a lot of work. Holy, like, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've been offered great help from those organizations I've mentioned already. And, you know, we're definitely going to take, take them up on that. Um, but just starting with, you know, even getting the, you know, getting a board set, getting governance set, um, you know, getting your insurances in place, creating what is, what's involved in your lesson plan. What are your skill sets? What are your competencies? You wouldn't believe how long we argued over the size of ropes and like just all, all kinds of things. Like it's, it's, it's not a fast process. It's actually moving quicker than I expected. Um, there's, we're certainly not, or not rushing anything, but we're, we're trying, we're certainly not wanting to leave it stagnant as well. Like we're meeting almost every week as a board um, and we're all family men and or family people and professionals in our industry and we're busy. It's a ton of extra work, but it's something we really believe in. Um, we're working on our competencies and lesson plans and manuals right now. And we hope to, run a bit of a beta course in January, which is a everything we want to, we want to make sure this is peer reviewed. Um, we want to make sure that we have people work, people participating in our industry kind of give us and people within other industries that have done this before, you know, see what we're doing, see what our ideas are. Um, and then before we say, yeah, this is, this is the way it is. We want to make sure we get feedback from our community, feedback from our peers, run it through. And, you know, that might take, that might take two or three or four or five or six times. We don't know what the future holds, but it's it's got to start somewhere. And it started with a very core group of amazing professional people that are volunteering their time and their money to get this done. And, uh, you know, it just feels really good. Well, it's a great project you're working on there. And I think uh, Delivering Adventure is going to follow you through this process, if that's okay. And we'll check in with you in a number of months and and see how you and Steve and the team are doing. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we've got a got an amazing team, and uh, you know Steve Scott out of Revelstoke. There is, you know, he's acting as he's our president right now, and I, you know, I think he'd be a, a another great guest on this show. And um, his his experience and professionalism that he brings to the table is is really going to help lead our team. Yeah. Well, it's been great chatting with you. We're going to let you go here, Curtis. If you would like to learn more about Crystal Ridge, you can visit the Varda website at ridevalemount.com. If you want to find Curtis at his snowmobile guiding and avalanche instruction company, Frozen Pirate, you can find him at frozenpirate.com. You can also learn more about Curtis by checking out his Instagram page, at Frozen Pirate. 
We have posted all of these links in the show notes. Well, Chris, what were your takeaways from part two? Well, a lot of great uh, things there from Curtis. Very interesting guy. We have an awesome story uh, that he's shared with us that you you will want to stick around for. But two points I want to highlight. First one is to be collaborative. And that means being willing to work with all groups and being respectful of all the stakeholders. The second point I want to highlight is be creative. So this means thinking outside the box. Every adventure experience has evolved into what it is now over time. This includes kiteboarding, stand-up paddle boards, mountain biking when it started. You know, originally, uh, Jordy, I think you and I are old enough to both remember that bikes actually didn't always have shocks. In fact, I can remember the first first bike I ever saw that actually had a shock. It was quite a revelation. I actually Ice raced climb. mountain bikes. I, I raced mountain bikes with no shocks, and I still feel the pain. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, you know, other things that kind of come to mind, you know, is ice climbing towers, zip lines, you know, all of these things required imagination to develop. You remember the first time I went snowboarding again, not to date myself, but the first time I went snowboarding, we actually had to put our ski boot liners in a pair of Sorels because there were no snowboard boots yet. They actually hadn't been uh, hadn't been designed and, and manufactured. So, uh, coming up with all of this is uh, requires a lot of creativity, and this is something that Varda uh, seems to have a lot of, which is great to hear. Jordy, what were your key takeaways? Yeah, Chris, I was just thinking about my days with the Burton Elite One Hundred and Fifty. Had kind of <laughs> this this rounded base where the further you leaned over, the less chance you were going to get an edge. <laughs> so some of my takeaways, Curtis is just full of knowledge. The guy is, he's been doing what he's been doing for a long time and doing a really good job of it in a pretty small community setting. And that's, that's no easy feat to find funding and to, to pull off what he's pulled off and he's still going. So just, just wait. I'm sure there's more to come for him. Uh, some of my thoughts are, create and utilize a structure. So this involves creating a plan and therefore you will need a process to develop that plan. Using the Snowmobile Guiding Association as an example, they have a plan and they're enacting that plan in an organized way. That should lead them to having a good chance of success. Uh, Another thought is presentation. You need to be quite good at influencing people. Chris here wrote a book about this called Power to Influence how to get the best out of yourself and others. Check out the link to purchase it in the show notes. It's definitely a very good overview on how to work at influencing people and getting to where you want to go. Chris and I sent questions to Curtis, for example, to prepare for his episode. Curtis was actually a little bit upset with us in a fun way because we actually changed some of the questions between when we sent them to him and when we started the interview. Uh, because he did want to be super prepared and it just shows the type of person that he is. And it explains really how he's been so successful in his endeavors. I'll also refer you to our episode eight with Sarah Archer, where she speaks about the benefits of having attention to detail. Uh, Those are all excellent points, Jordy. And uh, I'm really excited to see how things uh, continue to progress up in Vail Mount. And I'm looking forward to having an update from Curtis in the future to see how things are going. So now let's turn this over to you, the listener. What were your takeaways? You can share your thoughts on this episode or this show by sending us an email at team at deliveringadventure.com. You can also find us via our social media feeds or at our website, deliveringadventure.com. We posted all of this info and links to where you can find Curtis in the show notes. Before we go, we have one last funny story from Curtis to share with you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> you know, in our in our in our busy lives, these we tend to forget a few things because we're so focused on on the next step, and then you got to look back and try to figure this out. And you know, I actually asked my family the other night. I said, you know, have what have you guys heard? You're the guys who remember all this. What have what have I? What stupid shit have I done? Or what have you noticed? And What's funny, the the theme that actually came from it was, <laughs> it's, it is, it's kind of embarrassing and a little bit of asshole-ish as well, is 
Um, if I think I've gotten myself into trouble, and I mean not not guiding, this is personal, um, and, and trouble I mean loosely, um, but if I think I've gotten myself into trouble, I, I've realized that I don't like being alone. Um, so I tend to goat someone down there with me. <laughs> and I don't know if that's that's for the better or not. Or, um, you know, we're we have a little area on a, a more of an intermediate advanced snowmobile zone, right? Basically right behind our house. We can access from town and um, we're we're always pushing terrain. You know, snowmobiling, believe it or not, we don't have a lot of terrain, depending on where you are. We're, we're limited into some smaller zones and. Um, but you're always trying to find every little nook and cranny of the zones you get into. And, and I ended up in a um, skiing or snowboarding, you'd call it a pillow line, um, but like a very big pillow line on snowmobiles. And you really couldn't see the bottom. And I kind of fell off the first pillow and on my snowmobile. And I was like, well, that was, that was fine. That was cool. But holy man, there's, there's a bunch more down there. And so I go off the second one and, you know, I look up and I hear my, you know, I'm on my radio and my buddy said, how is it? And I'm looking up and I don't know how the hell I'm getting out of there, but I could see my house and, uh, you know, it was getting dark and I said, oh, it's great, man. Come on down. <laughs> you know, so now buddy pops down there. He says, well, that, that wasn't really good. I said, well, you know what? I know what I realized. I just didn't want to be alone down there. I wanted someone to suffer with me. And that's not the only time. Like there's the, we, we actually laughed and for quite a few minutes last night, there's a, there's several instances of where I got myself into a pickle and I didn't want to be alone. And I coerced someone to come down there and play with me. Yeah. 